ones are heeding him. I have the privilege of serving as United States Magistrate Judge here for the United States District Court for the District of Oregon. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the O'Connell Conference and the CLE that will continue throughout this afternoon. This annual event is made possible by an endowment established by a former Oregon law professor and Oregon Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice Kenneth O'Connell. This generous gift to the law school allows Oregon law to have a forum every year for the legal community to examine topics in public law and policy. We also have the fortune, the, we are also fortunate that the endowment supports several student fellowships annually. Just, Justice O'Connell had an interest in offering programs that would be of value to judges. Well, because of course, it's always important for us judges to learn something new once in a while. Even when it's tough to teach old dogs new tricks. And speaking of old dogs, there are a number of my colleagues in the room today who I'd like to acknowledge and introduce. I'd like to extend a welcome to my dear friend and colleague, Judge Acosta. Bow wow. <laughs> <laughs> woof, woof, woof. <laughs> oh, wait. Is that technically a husky shout? Because take that back. <laughs> uh, I also like to welcome the Honorable Alyssa Rookley, uh, who won't acknowledge herself here in the back room of the room. Honorable Robert Klein. The Honorable Timothy Sircom. The Honorable Rex Armstrong. And the Honorable Joel DeVore. Thank you all for being here. Now, before we turn to our program, I am moved to honor this land. And I ask you also to take a moment, in fact, perhaps several moments, to contemplate and feel the sacredness of this land on which we are sitting and walking. The sacredness of this land, it's the bounty that bestows on us and the universal obligation to steward this earth that moves me to acknowledge it. And not only because it sustains us, because that's far too selfish a motivation, but because it too has a right to be free from our failings. In this spirit, I also acknowledge that the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Elihi, the, tradi the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapu Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, the United States government stole this land from the Kalapuya people who were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland and removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and Confederated Tribes of the Silets Indians. And they continue to make important contributions to their communities, to the University of Oregon, Oregon is a state and to the world. Now, to acknowledge this is necessary, but on its own, totally insufficient. To truly change the way in which we walk this earth, my friends, we must also carry the intention to do so and then act. Otherwise, acknowledgement alone is a hollow shell. Now, with those words in mind, I turn to our CLE at hand and the US Supreme Court. During the 2021-2022 term, the court issued decisions with significant implications for our nation, how government functions, and how individuals will be allowed or restricted from living their lives. Now, we have a limited time today, and we'll only be able to explore three significant topics from this past term. And additionally, we will hear a preview of the upcoming terms, upcoming term, excuse me, which will certainly prove to be consequential, and no less than this last. So I was thrilled to be invited to moderate the first panel today, 
And when I asked how many other panelists were speaking, Jennifer Geller well, told me just one. So you want me to moderate a panel of one? I asked. Well, then I then asked, well, well, who is it? Well, she told me it was Associate Dean and Professor Stuart Chin. Ah, well, now I understand. <laughs> now, if you haven't met him yet, you will soon see that he is atomically dynamic. A moderator is necessary. <laughs> in, addi in addition to serving as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and as a professor, Stuart Chin is the James O. and Alfred T. Goodwin Senior Fellow. His areas of expertise include constitutional law, legislation, and political history. Associate Dean Chin is currently working on a set of projects related to American civic norms. He received his BA, JD, and PhD from Yale University. He will deliver remarks today that explore the recent cases and what they tell us about the United States Supreme Court and constitutional interpretation. We only have 45 minutes, less a few, for this session. Associate Dean Chin will share his thoughts for about 25 of the remaining minutes, and then I will be happy to field questions from the audience. There'll be a 50 minute break after this session before we begin the next. Please welcome me, uh, oh, please, no, not welcome me, please help me. <laughs> please help me welcome uh, Associate, Professor, uh, Associate Dean and Professor Stuart Chin. Judge Cosway for those very powerful introductory comments. Um, I'm happy to get a signal from either you or Jennifer if uh, where, where we are in time. Um, I've got a bit to talk about, and I think we are <laughs> going to rapidly reach the end of the program soon. So I do want to leave some time for broader questions, and if need be, I can definitely cut a few things out along the way. But I want to focus my comments on two really high-profile cases from the court's term uh, last term and talk about how they relate to the topic of historical approaches to constitutional interpretation. And so those two cases are Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization and New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. Um, and I will state from the outset that if you are inclined towards more Democratic Party inspired, uh, progressive inspired views, there's an obvious observation or charge you might make about these two cases in that it sort of suggests that the court majority was hypocritical in its rulings in these two cases. So on the one hand, in the Dobbs case, we hear the court majority say that they will uh, defer to state legislative solutions on the abortion rights issue. However, when it comes to gun rights, in the Bruin case, we see no such democratic deference. We see instead the court being willing to set aside this New York state law dealing with gun control. So how to explain this differential posture and to be principled at the same time? What the court would say, what the court majority would say, is that there was a right involved in the Bruin case, the Second Amendment. That's what justifies setting aside the New York state law. However, in the context of abortion, there is no constitutional right. And that is what justifies leaving the issue for state legislative resolution. Um, and in short, this suggests sort of the thorniest problem in some ways of thinking about constitutional law in a more principled way in that judicial activism looks like it can be, can be quite selective in terms of when it's applied. Um, and, and indeed, if you disagree with the court's rulings, you might find it hypocritical. Uh, the, the, the point, this charge that I'm making could also be, um, in fairness, uh, made by those on the conservative side of things. You might look at past progressive rulings that they disagree with as well and accuse the uh, more progressive-minded court of being more activist in some cases and less activist in other cases. But the core of why the court might settle in one direction or the other boils down to whether a court majority can find or one might argue unfind a constitutional right. That sort of settles this question. And so um, setting that as our primary question the, the focus of my discussion today is how historical analysis has been used or deployed to find, or one might say, unfind a constitutional right. All right, so let me just make a few comments describing what occurred in these two cases, and then I'm going to try to conclude with three broad thoughts about historical analysis and interpretation and where I think this might be going in the near future. So in the Dobbs case, which I'm sure everybody in this room has heard about, we have a majority opinion written by Justice Alito, uh, writing for a majority of five, um, Justice Roberts, concurred in parts of the ruling, but not in uh, the larger analysis, not in some crucial parts of the larger analysis of the Alito opinion. Uh, and the conclusion is that there is no constitutional right to an abortion. Now the reasoning by 
Alito and um, his majority was that the right to an abortion does not exist in the text of the first eight amendments, so we don't have any textual support for this right. And then going beyond that, to the extent that one might argue that an abortion right is an implied constitutional right, uh, Alito and the majority argued that it was not, that it was not an unenumerated implied constitutional right because it was not rooted in history and tradition or essential to ordered liberty. And in making that claim, this court majority is relying upon the notable case of Washington versus Glucksburg. So here we see this argument where historical analysis is figuring in prominently and essentially deciding for this court that the rights of abortion doesn't exist because it's not rooted in history and tradition and not essential to order liberty. With no constitutional rights to an abortion existing, the court says rationality review applies. And as is almost always the case, when rationality review applies, the state law in question is going to be upheld. Alito does nod, in his opinion, to maybe the best historical argument in favor of Roe and in favor of abortion rights. He notes that if we look to the common law for guidance, it was noteworthy that the common law did not criminalize pre-quickening abortions. And Alito notes that and concedes that point, but nevertheless says that, well, just because the common law didn't criminalize these pre-quickening abortions doesn't mean that there's a positive constitutional right to it either. Um, anyway, I mentioned that point just because uh, in acknowledging that ambiguity, Alito is at least giving some concession to one of the inherent challenges of historical analysis, that almost always that historical record is going to be ambiguous. It's almost always not going to give us clear answers to the questions we care about most today. Um, two additional thoughts to say about the Alito opinion before I move on to the dissent. Alito is also quite dismissive in the opinion about public legitimacy concerns. He has this point where he says that the court should not be looking to public opinion in deciding cases. And if you follow the news, Chief Justice Roberts said something quite similar recently in a public remark. And I might argue, at least in my opinion, that that's quite appropriate for a judge to say in a public context. I, maybe some of the judges here may or may not disagree with what I'm about to say here. That's quite appropriate to say in a public context. But I think it's quite problematic for justices of the Supreme Court to actually think that that is the case. Um, you know, the, the, the crucial lesson for anyone who remembers Con Law 1 of Marbury versus Madison is this story, so the conventional story goes, of how Chief Justice Marshall saved the US Supreme Court precisely because he was attuned to the political realities of what he was doing. And indeed, for any judge concerned about the legitimacy of the court they're serving on, for its influence, its enduring power and, and, and significance, being attentive to where its rulings are going to land, how they're going to be received, I think is quite crucial to the job description. And it's not to say that I believe that judges should be consulting public opinion polls on a daily basis or something, nothing like that. But it is to say that if we actually stocked a US Supreme Court full of judges who cared nothing at all about how the public might receive their rulings, that this is a court that's probably not going to survive for very long. And indeed, to that extent, um, we are seeing that the court has dipped to new levels of lower public approval after the Dobbs opinion. Um, the, the last thing I'll say about the Alito opinion is, at least again, just in my opinion, it does demonstrate a kind of judicial arrogance that we've seen over a number of other Supreme Court cases where every once in a while you see the court sort of put forward this view that if it just decides a certain issue, a controversial issue in a decisive way, it's going to tamp down the conflict and make it sort of settle a little bit more. And almost always that calculation sort of backfires. And there's some of the most, uh, some of the cases in the top 10 of, you know, top 10 of all time were Supreme Court decisions sort of betray that kind of judicial arrogance. We think about this in this regard, uh, the Lochner ruling or Dred Scott, things like that. And one might believe that maybe uh, the Dobbs decision might sort of fall in that category as well, where this court believed that by making this strong decision, it was going to tamp down the abortion controversy, at least by early results so far, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, to the contrary, we're seeing this issue expand and encompass multiple dimensions and occurring in more and more contexts, right? The issue has sort of grown in its volatility. With respect to the dissent, written jointly by Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor, uh, at least by my read of it, the tone of the opinion was incredibly frustrated, uh, disappointed, and I think you can see spots of anger throughout the opinion as well. Uh, not surprisingly, these dissenters were not at all comforted by the assurances of Alito and by Justice Kavanaugh in uh, Kavanaugh's concurrence that other substantive due process cases were not at risk, right? That was the sort of line made by Alito and by Justice Kavanaugh, that even though this precedent in Roe and Casey, that these were falling, that other precedents in same-sex intimacy, same-sex marriage, uh, contraception, that those would survive. And this court, I'm sorry, these dissenters were not uh, at all convinced or reassured by that, by those comments. And indeed, what they point to is the fact that if you look at the ruling of the majority or uh, Alito's opinion for the court, um, Alito argued that these other precedents, these other sub substantive due process cases were safe because in cases of same-sex marriage, contraception, et cetera, we don't have this worry about potential life, which does exist with abortion. And that's why, or that's how that court majority thought 
that the abortion precedents could fall and not sort of subsequently endanger these other precedents. But these dissenters come back to that and say, well, actually, the analysis in the Dobbs opinion is not about potential life. The analysis is about how the right can't be justified by historical traditions. And if that is our test, that same exact test could be used to undermine these other substantive due process cases. Uh, Justice Thomas, to his credit, was pretty upfront about this in his concurrence and said, oh, yeah, like, we actually might have to reexamine these other substantive due process cases. Uh, so, um, uh, so these dissenters in the, in the same vein were not at all reassured that some of these other cases that we've taken for granted for decades will still be there um, in a stable state going forward. Let me, uh, I'll say one final comment about this and then I'll spend a couple of minutes about the Bruin case. The last thing I'll say about the dissent, and this is to come back to a, a point I'll make at the end of my remarks, is that it was notable to me in reading the dissent, th and this is one of the parts of the opinion that wasn't leaked early on, about was how strong a defense it demonstrated of living constitutionalism. Uh, to my mind, what has been dominant in discussions about the Constitution among the Supreme Court, uh, certain appellate opinions, among con law scholars, has been this focus on the significance of historical analysis. And here we see the dissenters not just pushing back on the centrality of historical analysis, but even being borderline dismissive or mocking of it. Um, there's this, I'm, I'm not going to carry the flavor of this, but th if you read the opinion, there's this like very notable line. I would bet heavily that it was a line written by Justice Kagan because she has a very distinctive writing style where um, she's mocking Alito for quoting common law sources from the 13th century. And she has in parentheses, 13th with an exclamation mark. Like who would actually do this, right? Um, I feel that this might be an element of analysis going forward where uh, historical analysis in some ways has been damaged in a significant way because of its association with the Dobbs ruling. But I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Okay, uh, on Bruin, just a couple of remarks about Bruin. So in this case, we had were members of the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, and they wished to obtain a state license to carry a concealed pistol or revolver in public. Right? So this is sort of taking the gun right from where it had been earlier in the Heller case, where it was sort of handguns in the home, to actually bringing these weapons or these handguns or pistols into the public sphere. New York law permitted this. They permitted such licenses for this sort of uh, public carry if there was proper cause for the individual requesting it to carry a concealed weapon. And so persons requesting such licenses had to demonstrate, quote, a special need for self-protection distinguishable from that of the general community. Right? That was the law in question. And the court ultimately strikes this New York state law down, and in doing so makes clear that not only is there an individual right to handguns within the home for self-defense, but in addition to that, that we might be able to read the Second and Fourteenth Amendments more broadly to include an individual right to possess handguns outside the home for self-defense. The crucial change with this opinion was how the court articulated the test for evaluating the um, any sort of uh, legal restrictions on gun possession. Um, so I'm not, without boring you on the, the sort of technical doctrinal language, there had prior to this been a test developed by several courts of appeals in terms of how to adjudicate gun rights claims under these various state restrictions and so forth. And what the court decides here, and this is an opinion written by Justice Thomas, I'm just going to quote from the opinion. Um, the court concludes that in keeping with Heller, we, the court, hold that when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. So what we have here is a test that starts with a presumptive, presumptive protection of the gun right based upon the text of the Second Amendment. And then going on, the court says, to justify its regulation, the government may not simply posit that the regulation promotes an important interest. Rather, the government must demonstrate that the regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. And only if the firearm regulation is consistent with this nation's historical traditions may that um, regulation stand, right? May it sort of survive Second Amendment scrutiny. Um, the key thing that I'll just say about this test, and without getting into the technical details of the doctrinal test, is that under the old test that the Court of Appeals had applied, it recognized the ambiguity of historical evidence, but it sort of put the ambiguity of that and the burden of that upon uh, the state and litigants equally. It was sort of shared, whereas under this new test, what seems clear is that the ambiguities of historical analysis and the burdens of that are being put upon the state to justify a regulation. So it sort of shifted the burden of proving, making one's case, and made the difficulty of using historical analysis uh, put more squarely as a burden upon the state in justifying gun rights. And so what we have here is a strengthening of the gun right um, and a weakening, I would argue, of state ability, a state's ability to regulate them. Now, there are some qualifying points. There are arguments made after this case that the New York state law was a little distinctive and you know, it may not be the most common regulation, but, but that's a side point. Um, the couple of historical points that I want to say about this opinion, though, I have a couple. The first is 
it is interesting that Justice Thomas wrote this opinion for the court, and he made a really strong link between the defense of the gun right and racial equality, actually drawing back to history from the post-Reconstruction era and talking about how that was one of the crucial rights for African Americans in that very sort of violent time um, after the Civil War. But beyond that, there is also a discussion about history in the dissent. This is written by Breyer with Sotomayor and Kagan Joni. Um, and Breyer, in dissent, makes clear a number of concerns about historical analysis that had been floating around. I mean, these are not new, but they, they've been floating around. And I think he makes them with additional urgency and energy in this opinion. Um, makes the point or notes the point that do we really want judges to be so fixated on history? Is this really what their institutional competence is? Do they have the training for it? Do they have the resources for it? Do we want judges to be amateur historians? Is this actually what judges should be doing? Um, and the second is, and this is, to my mind, maybe the most powerful critique about historical analysis. It's inherently limiting, right? If we think about historical analogs to the present time, we don't have any. To think about our concerns around, say, mass shootings, the saturation of American society with guns, there's no historical analog to give us guidance for that in the past. And so do we want to look, rely upon history for such crucial social questions that are confront us today? Um, and I, I guess the last thing I'll say in this regard, too, was this came up in a powerful way in the Heller case back in 2008, where if one was making a charge or crit a critique of the conservative majority in that case, they said they were relying upon a textual historical analysis. But if you remember that case, the court ultimately said that there was this indiv individual right to handguns for self-protection. And as the dissent said in that case, it's kind of weird that a historically oriented opinion would find a defense of handguns since you know, handguns weren't a thing in 1787, right? So it's, it, there's this sort of charge that emerges from this where it seems like the conservative majority is sort of picking and choosing when it's going to rely upon historical analysis and when it's going to sort of blissfully ignore it or sort of gloss over it. Okay, so let me just sort of transition and conclude now with three broader general thoughts, trying to weave together some of these comments from these two cases. The first comment I make, and it, it, you know, just to reiterate what I just said, is to um, suggest possibly that we're at a moment where there's going to be a pushback against historical analysis and constitutional interpretation. Um, we hear this frustration from the dissenters in both Dobbs and in Bruin about the concerns of historical evidence being murky, about the recognition that judicial discretion is going to be impossible to avoid, even if one is committed to historical analysis, because the historical record is always going to be ambiguous. The second longer point I would make is this. It's a point about the legitimacy of method or about how method links to outcomes. So I think we're accustomed to thinking about this, at least in con law, about how method bolsters the legitimacy of an outcome, right? So typical argument, you know, outcome A is correct because textual analysis supports it, right? That's an argument meant to support outcome A because the textual, the analysis itself makes the legitimacy of A greater. But I would try to lean on this idea that that relationship can operate in the other direction as well. That sometimes if your method leads you to consistently problematic results, it creates legitimacy issues for that method, right? It's like think about this in the context of a religion or an ideology. If your religion or ideology consistently leads you to outcomes that are more, you know, that you find intuitively problematic, you might question that religion or ideology. And indeed, there's a really good example of this in the context of con law, which is in the earliest stages of originalism, when originalism sort of first came on the scene, it was notable that this, was a, this methodology was very hard to reconcile with Brown versus Board of Education, and that case is prohibition on school segregation. Uh, so the argument went, Brown is an opinion that, almost, that just about everybody agrees is rightly decided, but if you have this methodology, originalism, that can't justify Brown, well then this methodology can't be taken seriously. It shouldn't be something we should adopt. And indeed, the weight of this charge was serious enough that the defenders of originalism understood this. So some of the earliest defenders of originalism spent a lot of energy precisely on this point to try to prove how their methodology could be made consistent with Brown or could actually prove Brown. I will say I'm not convinced by those arguments, but they made a good attempt at it, and they spent a lot of time trying to make that argument. But it's underscoring how the method itself sometimes is based upon what kind of outcomes it's going to generate. Well, in that regard, I think that we might see something similar happening with this case where, and I wouldn't make the claim that Roe versus Wade was enjoyed anywhere near the consensus of agreement that Brown versus Board of Education did and does, but I think that precedent had been around for long enough, you know, decades and decades, and has enough sort of support within the American polity that because this historical methodology has been associated with the overturning of Roe, it is leading to a more vigorous questioning of the value of historical methodologies in constitutional interpretation. I think the legitimacy of the method has taken a hit after this case. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this actually evolves. And I will say, or I'll admit, I'm of, of a mixed opinion about this. Uh, on the one hand, I, if, if 
democratic-minded or progressive-minded con law observers or participants moved in a direction more skeptical to historical inquiry. On the one hand, there's a part of that that I don't really like. Um, intellectually, actually, if you, my scholarship is actually quite historically informed. I actually do believe that in terms of social reform, uh, historical traditions are an incredibly powerful tool for making uh, durable reform, right? To be able to link changes that one is seeking to past traditions is an incredibly powerful tool, both as a legal matter, but also as a matter of political rhetoric and politics. Um, and, I did, and indeed, stable reform, I think, often has to think deeply about the traditions, the context that sort of preceded it. But on the other hand, there's a part of me that thinks that this is not such a bad development, um, which is to say that even if progressives have been able to use historical tools to their benefit in pressing certain goals, it is probably the case that historical analysis is a terrain where the terrain's gonna always be tilted away from change and more in favor of the status quo. That's just the nature of how the, the, the analysis is oriented. And so maybe there will be some benefit for more progressive-minded observers and participants to make full-throated defenses of living constitutionalism, right? That we should be pressing forward ideas of the Constitution that are not seeking further guidance, you know, um, dusty records from the ninth, you know, 13th century, 14th century, but instead confronting more squarely contemporary problems, contemporary issues, and contemporary circumstances. Maybe that is actually going to be a good thing. And maybe that would create for a more stable and more compelling moral vision to press in uh, future political contests. And so finally, am I doing okay on time or? Okay, okay, good, okay. I have one last thought, so good, um, good. I, I wanted to make sure that there was some more time for, uh, for people to be able to offer any questions or comments. Let me conclude with one last thought in terms of what a progressive informed historical analysis might look like. And I'll offer this by saying, nothing that I'm gonna say here is terribly original, especially if you read con law articles. But I guess the, the question that I might pose to those who are um, you know, interested in this is, does this sound like something that actually could be compelling in the public sphere, in the, in the realm of politics and debate? And I don't know, I'm of a mixed mind about that too, but I'll offer this. I think what a historically minded version of progressive analysis would look like would be something that looked like what Justice Blackman did in Roe, in the Roe opinion itself. So for those who remember that opinion or can recall that opinion, Justice Blackman proceeded and argued that actually there was a right to an abortion that was rooted in principle, and that was rooted, I'm sorry, that was rooted in tradition, that was rooted in history. What he did was he looked at these past precedents that sort of articulated a general right of privacy. And from these prior precedents that were focused in these different social contexts, he was able to sort of extrapolate from them to bring to a greater level of generality the idea of a right to privacy. And that's how he was able to then take that right to privacy and then link it to this newer context of abortion rights. And for what it's worth, I think that that's a compelling argument. And if, for what it's worth, I think that's probably the most accurate, honest description of how most Americans might think about abortion rights if they're sympathetic to them. That it may not be this thing that people thought about in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was written, but we have these general principles of equality and liberty and privacy that have been persistent through our history. And we can see from those traditions how they're applicable to a context, to, a, to, to something like abortion rights, which has a very different meaning, one might think today, than it may have had um, you know, in 1868, where the primary concern of the drafters of the 14th Amendment was something very different. It was the aftermath of the Civil War and providing equality based upon race. Um, and so I guess the question I would pose is, does that sort of analysis work, you know, where we think about locating our defense of certain rights within traditions broadly defined or more generally defined? Would that be a compelling vision uh, in the public sphere? And again, I'm of a mixed mind about whether that would be a successful argument or not. So here's my more skeptical view about this, that that would never work. Um, and going to Judge Acosta, you know, invoking the J Chief Justice Roberts at his confirmation hearings, right? You know, balls, I mean, I'm, I'm just, judges are umpires. We just call balls and strikes. That sort of thing is frustratingly uh, simplistic, for, at least for a con law scholar, right? I mean, you know, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts was sort of mercilessly mocked, I guess, in uh, criticism after that confirmation hearing. But I will say this to the benefit of Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts' approach. That sort of simplicity of description of what judges do, that makes sense to people in the public sphere. There is a simplicity of that description that sort of cuts through nuance and ambiguity and just sort of intuitively makes sense and is power, incredibly powerful right, rhetorically. Um, and I think, so this is the pessimistic part of me. For, one might think that maybe the sorts of stories that Democrats and progressives tell in the space where it's about nuance and uh, balancing and competing rights, so this is just very hard to communicate in a simple, compelling way in the public sphere. So again, this is the pessimistic part of me that thinks this would never work. <laughs> now, the more optimistic part of me, there is po the possibility that maybe the message would work. It's just that Democrats and progressives have just not found the right messenger for this idea, right? Or we have not, um, 
or that constituency has not found the right vessel for the message, or the message has not been sort of sharpened in such a way that it is compelling to a broader populace. So maybe the message could still work. It just hasn't found the right note to be articulated. I'm not sure. Um, and, and the very last thing I'll say about this, as we head, enter this new stage, specific, especially about abortion rights, is that the political terrain has really been scrambled, right? So um, in the same vein that Democrats and progressives have now have to think about what kind of philosophy of interpretation they would put forward, I think the same is going to be true for opponents of abortion rights as well. So in a prior time where they could just simply be in favor of every restriction of abortion rights and to say, well, that's the law and you know, we're going to follow these judges, that's not going to work in this era where all of a sudden these uh, uh, opponents of abortion rights now have to make clear their position, position on what sorts of exceptions will be allowed, what sort of time limit would be allowed, um, how far would the restrictions on abortion rights go, and of course they can't sort of rely upon the law being the law as their defense because we're also in a moment where we're seeing the U.S. Supreme Court take some serious hits to its legitimacy as well. So they're going to have to figure out what their public philosophy is going to be just like Democrats and progressives will as well. So I'm going to stop there, but I would really be curious to hear your thoughts on anything that I've talked about so far. You probably know there have been bills introduced into Congress to adopt a federal uh, law on abortion. And the question is, of course, that seems to be inconsistent with the rationale in laws. So the question I have is, do you think the Supreme Court will go in the direction of the Tenth Amendment, which supports states' rights, or will they go in the direction of the Supremacy Clause which would allow them to uphold yeah. uh, the federal law. So yeah. how do you see the future unfolding? Very much, and I, my, my guess is the future are no better than anybody else's. But you're thinking about federal bans on abortion rights, right? That's what you're thinking about? Yeah. Um, so if we believe the court majority, right, and you know, there are reasons why one might be skeptical about that or might approach that with caution, one would think that if a federal ban on abortion rights was passed and made its way to the court, that you would see, in theory, I think the three liberals on this court, plus Roberts and Kavanaugh, not be sympathetic to such a thing, right? That's in theory. That's what, so I think you could probably find, at least by what they've said in the Dobbs opinion, five votes to suggest that such a ban would not be allowed. But, you know, who knows, right? I mean, who knows where that might ultimately go? Um, I, I think that if you did see a court majority approve such a ban, yes, it would sort of lay bare the hypocrisy of the opinion itself, because what we hear in Dobbs itself is in, you know, the court majority saying things like, we believe in state resolution this issue, federalism, this is a complicated issue, and a national ban on abortion rights would clearly be totally contradictory of like, all those comments. Um, it's an old line in con law you know, that uh, it's easy to find the hypocrisy in con law because so much of the doctrine just shifts with, the, as, as, as you know well, right? Uh, it shifts well with the number of votes that are on that court at that moment in time. So um, uh, yeah, in theory, the court should strike such a thing down. I don't know that I would necessarily take that as a guarantee. Would that opinion of yours be the same if it were uh, if you were thinking of a, a term 20 years ago? Oh, so we think about like a corporate issue essentially like long ago. Oh, oh, well, yeah, okay, so, yeah. I, I, what I'm trying to get at is that given, given yeah. what, it's, it's a new creature. Absolutely, and absolutely. You don't know what's going to happen in the uh, Absolutely, I mean, I'll say just my own experience. I've been teaching Calm life here in Oregon since 2009, cover the abortion rights cases every, every year, um, a little bit in con law too, but mo uh, mostly in our first con law class. And every time we got to these abortion rights cases, I always thought to myself, you know, this, this, this question has come up, right? It's, it's been central for every new judicial appointment, especially when it's a new Republican party appointee, will Roe survive? And my thinking that entire time has been, for the most part, there's no way they're gonna strike this thing down. It's been on the books for too long. Um, and, and I thought, there's even a part of me that thought that even when the conventional wisdom was that Roe was going to fall with this court because the numbers were just there. And so I will confess that even though, I mean, this, like, this is what, you know, I, I follow these cases, is I knew what the conventional wisdom was, it still struck me as a surprise in a way that it probably shouldn't have, but it still did, I, that I could not believe that this court was going to strike down this precedent that had been there for 50 years. Um, and so, yes, I, I think we're all socialized into thinking about the rhythms of the Supreme Court based upon our lived experience and sort of what we learn and so forth. And when I think about where this court is today, it just feels quite different than anything, certainly in my lived experience.
you. The, the opinion in Dobbs is more that it's more based on the fact that there isn't a recognized constitutional right to abortion, rather than it's a state's realm to regulate this type of thing. So really, a, a, a constitute or a congressional limitation on abortion wouldn't really necessarily be inconsistent with the reasoning in Dobbs. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that most trans are fair in the opinion, but I think that it's interrelated. Um, it's, it, I, I do think that's all in about it. There, there is language in the Dobbs and Majority opinion that sort of emphasizes the nature of the abortion issue is so controversial that like the court would rather it be resolved through these different venues. But, but you're right, on at least that first part of it, because the court determines that there is no constitutional right, that part on its own, yeah, that wouldn't necessarily be inconsistent with the idea of some sort of federal legislation pro or against abortion rights. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. I'm wondering toward the future with DOP, sticking with DOP, and constitutional rights, what about freedom of religion and freedom of speech? There are now state universities being told they cannot talk about contraceptives, which is even beyond us. Okay, and then on freedom of religion, there are numerous religious groups that include abortion rights as a very fundamental belief, for instance, Judaism and quite a few Christian sects. So what do you see going forward in those two areas of constitutional protection? Yeah, and this will be a great question for Garrett when uh, Garrett's session there on sees the Garrett's more the more than I am, but I'll offer my own observation about this. Uh, we're seeing both of these elements be sort of uh, quite prominent in the course rationale. So if you're trying to press whatever your favored constitutional rights are, um, you would think that you'd be well served by talking about them in terms of religious rights, because this court seems to be deeply sympathetic to those sorts of things uh, at this moment. I, so I think we're going to see more movement there. Um, and indeed, on this issue about free speech, you brought up the context of um, you know, public education and so forth. There is, I think, litigation that's gotten started with respect to uh, what, you know, Governor DeSantis and the Florida universities and so forth. There could be an interesting Supreme Court test around the scope of academic freedom. That'll be an interesting thing to see. Um, I just mentioned this in my class the other day. You know, we've had affirmative action as a sort of part of our federal constitutional law since the Bakke decision in the late 70s. Conventional wisdom is that's probably going to go away in this next term. So um, dramatic transformations in con law, I think, potentially coming up. And, you know, I say this, you can probably all tell from my comments so far, I'm clearly not impartial about this. I lean more to the democratic progressive side of things. But, you know, I guess that's another element of the hypocrisy, the charge of hypocrisy one can make. One of the earliest offenses of originalism and historical analysis was an aim towards judicial modesty. Like, that was the goal of it. It was to sort of not make judges inject their own personal views into these, I mean, that, that was the theory anyway. But we're seeing this court, I think, disrupt precedent in a dramatic way across a number of different areas. So there's nothing about this that looks to me, at least, like judicial modesty at all. Topic. Do you have any prediction on the future of Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, especially in light of his language in Dobbs uh, as far as it going forward on uh, restriction? Um, I mean, I just want to walk through the Supreme Court justice. Uh, no indication that that's you know, that he's going to be stepping off the court anytime soon. He's an interesting space as well there um, in terms of where the political activities of his wife. I think that was just reported in the Times the other day about giving an interview for the January 6th committee. So it's kind of interesting political posture there as well. Um, you know, what I guess would say about Justice Thomas is, you know, Justice Scalia got a lot of the attention as, you know, a strong proponent of textualism and originalism. But I think the real, and I think this is becoming a little bit clearer as time has gone on, the real ideological force on these things has really been Justice Thomas, you know. Um, and through some, whatever combination of both his activities, his opinions, and also just the political climate, um, he's, he's turned out to be very influential in terms of where uh, the Supreme Court has oriented itself on some of these points of analysis. And I, frankly, that influence is likely to continue, at least for, at least so long as the court composition remains what it is. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know that anyone necessarily would predict this back, back when he was coming up for nomination and confirmation to the court, but that's where we are. Is related to your comment on the methodology and specifically leads to problematic. Okay, I'm sorry. If my so my question is related to your comment on methodology 
consistently leading to problematic outcomes yeah. and how legitimacy is altered that way. Yeah. What about a more scientific approach for historical, well, instead of historical analysis, specifically addressing abortion rights? A more scientific analysis. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, um, this, is, this is a part of for the scholars of abortion rights. Uh, we'll note that when it's not like this is as the courts said, although I don't I didn't agree with like the context in which it was offered, but there's a part of this which is actually true. Uh, Justice, Alito, Justice Alito says in the job of your opinion that there's nothing new about abortion, right? And to, to some extent, I mean, that is accurate in the sense that this issue has like clearly not just given rise in the 20th century. Um, but it's striking to think about this issue as it existed in the 19th century it was not sort of the focal point of cultural and social division. I mean, I think this issue is something that we put a lot of content over various social divisions into it, and it sort of plays out in that way. But it wasn't always like that. And indeed, at an earlier stage of these discussions in the 19th century, it was seen as more of a medical issue, more of a medical procedure. And as such, it just didn't have quite the same sort of context and baggage around it. Is there a world in which we can ever get back to that? Maybe, but it's awfully hard to think about that right now, right? For better or worse, um, it seems like this issue has encapsulated the most severe divisions in American society and has been done so for decades. It's actually one of those issues where you know we see public opinion shift in dramatic ways in things like say same sex marriage, but that just hasn't happened in abortion rights. Like the, the sort of lines of public opinion division have been incredibly stable through decades. And what gives for that, I'm not sure. But so in theory it's possible. I don't know that it's gonna happen anytime soon. I'm gonna attempt to be slightly provocative as a moderator. All right. uh, in that you commented about uh, democratic progressive principles and ideals, and, and in, the, in that context, striving to find some explanation for what's happening sure. or develop tools that can be used yes. in promoting a conversation. Yes. I'm not sure who's wanting to have this conversation, uh, and those who seem to matter uh, with, with that conversation would be those of the nine on the Supreme Court. So, at, at what point does the jurisprudence simply turn to the notion of got to count the votes? Yeah, this, is like, this sort of gets to one of those sort of core enduring questions of constitutional law. Um, and I, you know, my PhD is in political science, so there's a part of me that you know, is, you know, thinks about this as just a vote ganger, so which is the kind of where a lot of public law scholarship has been on decades on this. Yet, this is the lawyer or the law school part of me. I, I, I am committed to this idea that through a good portion of those committed to the legal, um, to the legal culture, right? so beyond just the practice of the law, but like the legal culture writ large, that there is a commitment to a certain shared way of dialogue and analysis. And I, I hold on to the faith, the hope, that that is something that still exists. To the extent that such a thing still exists, uh, that gives me hope that there is a possible way to think about rational engagement across disagreement that goes beyond simply just saying, you know, just this goes beyond just simply raw exercises of power. So um, I will invite you back after the next term. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's kind of, I tend to be the more optimistic of my you know, peers who talk about this stuff about hoping for the future of American democracy. Right now. Hold on to that. Yeah. So I, I want to go back to this um, discussion about you know, federal ban and, and states' rights. I, I, you know, reading that Dobbs decision, the stuff about states' rights strikes me as different. Strikes me as not essential to their ruling, and so it has no precedential value. It has what it struck me was a dog whistle to the right, and and absolutely nothing else. That was a, that was to you know the right wants to hear states' rights because that's what the right wants to hear. So we throw that in there with no intent of being consistent about state rights because they have that of it. And so I just I'm curious why do you think that that has anything more than a dog whistle. All right, so we're going to go back to this question on faith a little bit. So, yeah, so I think take it, you would read the whole thing as obviously you just simply this question of no rights of abortion is it's not historically granted, not in the text, and yeah, which I think was the common made over here before as well, right? So, um, you know, in defense of that perspective, that's exactly where the dissenters are, right? I mean, that's exactly where they're. They don't believe any of this other stuff. And what they say in their dissent is some version of the court majorities articulated a logic for their for their ruling, and that logic clearly leads to this outcome where we do see things like Griswold Law, see Obergefell Law, all these other things, right? Okay, so fair enough. <laughs> Here's the faith part, but you know, I don't know. I'd say this cautiously. I don't know that I'm. I don't know how much faith I have in this, but um, I guess it, it's a it's a, a it relies, it relies upon a degree of faith that when Roberts and Kavanaugh are saying what they're saying about the weight of this divisiveness and 
recognizing the uh, challenge of the abortion rights issue, that they're not totally lying as they say that. Yeah. yeah. That, that's what it relies on. Yeah. I want to thank everybody. We are uh, finished with our, our first of a series of, of, panel, of panel presentations uh, this But as you can tell, uh, he needed the moderator. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or was it a regulator? <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. And please uh, join me in thanking Professor